All right, so Amazon, huh? You want to know how a little online bookstore became? Well, this... It's a wild story. It really is. We're talking about a company that will be celebrating its 30th anniversary soon. That's right. From humble beginnings to a global powerhouse. Absolutely. And today, we're taking a deep dive into the strategic decisions, the big moves that fueled Amazon's incredible rise. It's a fascinating case study in business strategy, that's for sure. We'll be exploring not just what they did, but uh, why it worked. We'll unpack some of those, well, unconventional tactics that allowed Amazon to, you could say, rewrite the rules of the retail game. Yeah, and they really did. Let's rewind, go back to 1994. Picture Amazon as this like scrappy startup. Can you imagine? Hard to believe now, right? I know. They were laser focused. I mean, really obsessed with getting books into the hands of readers no matter what. But they ran into a problem right out of the gate. Back then, book distributors, they had these minimum order quantities. Right. You had to order a certain number of copies, even if you weren't sure they would all sell. Exactly. So what did Amazon do? They got scrappy. To get around those minimums, they started ordering extra copies of books that were already out of stock. It's a classic example of their ingenuity, right? Finding loopholes, bending the rules to their advantage. Seriously, you've got to admire the hustle. But it makes you wonder, did this experience, this early taste of bending the rules, finding those creative solutions, did that like pave the way for their later moves? It's like a glimpse into their mindset, their whole approach to navigating the often treacherous waters of the business world. That's a really astute observation. You can absolutely draw a line from those early days to how Amazon handles things like inventory management and even their interactions with suppliers later on. But to really understand their dominance, their incredible success, we need to talk about their mastery of a little something called working capital. Okay, working capital. Essentially, it's how a company uses its available funds to keep things running, to operate day to day. But more importantly, it's about how they use those funds to grow, to expand. So break this down for me. How does Amazon use this working capital thing to go from online bookstore to, well, everything? I mean, they sell just about everything now. Okay, so think of it this way. Amazon generates a huge chunk of its revenue. We're talking about 60%, not from selling its own products, but from third-party sellers on its platform. They've created this massive online marketplace this digital bazaar where anyone can sell goods. Right, so it's like a digital mall with millions of different vendors all in one place. Precisely. But here's where things get really interesting. See, unlike traditional retailers, the kind with physical stores who generally pay their suppliers pretty quickly after a sale, Amazon, well, Amazon has a different approach. Oh, how so? They hold on to that money, that working capital, from those third-party sales for 38 days. 38 days, wow, that's over a month. I think most people would be, uh, you know, a little anxious waiting that long to get paid, especially if you're a smaller business. Oh, absolutely. And we'll dig into the implications for those sellers in a bit. But first, just wrap your head around the sheer volume of transactions happening on Amazon every single day. We're talking about a mind-boggling number of sales. So those delayed payments, they add up. We're talking about a massive pool of cash, a billion dollars every single day. And that's all money that Amazon can use for its own operations, for investments, for further expansion. It's brilliant, actually. While other companies are out there taking out loans, trying to woo investors, Amazon is basically sitting on this mountain of cash generated by its own marketplace. It's a power move for sure. It really is. By leveraging the cash flow from those third-party sellers, Amazon is essentially funding its own growth. It's like a self-perpetuating engine. More sellers equal more working capital, which fuels more expansion. And so on. Okay, so that's the Amazon win side of the equation. But this is where I start to wonder, what about those third-party sellers? Are they really benefiting from this arrangement? It seems like they're kind of fueling this rocket ship. But are they even getting a seat on board? That is the million-dollar question. And it gets to the heart of Amazon's business model, and maybe even to some potential downsides of their success. On the one hand, selling on Amazon gives these businesses many of them small businesses, access to this gigantic customer base, millions upon millions of potential shoppers all over the world. It's like the ultimate digital storefront. It's like setting up shop in the busiest shopping mall in the world, <laughs> except it's online and open 24-7, 365. Exactly. <laughs> but that prime real estate, well, it comes at a cost. And we're not just talking about those delayed payments. Amazon has created a seriously competitive environment for sellers, an environment that, as we'll see, ultimately benefits their own growth in some, shall we say, interesting ways. 
Okay, so let's talk about this cutthroat marketplace. What are the rules of the game and who really comes out on top? Well, let's talk about competition. It's fierce, to say the least. See, unlike, say, a Walmart, a traditional retailer that handpicks its suppliers, cultivates those relationships, Amazon's playing a different game. Right, they're not exactly known for cozy partnerships. Not quite. Yeah. It's more like a uh, free-for-all, this massive online marketplace where, frankly, anyone with an internet connection and something to sell can set up shop. So instead of carefully curating a selection of products and partners, it's more like Amazon just opens the floodgate and says, all right, let the games begin. Exactly. You've got millions of sellers all vying for the same customers, right? Competing on price, on visibility, on those all-important customer reviews, and this constant pressure, this intense competition. Well, it might be great for shoppers, at least in the short term, but for businesses, for those sellers, it's a pressure cooker. I can see how that plays right into Amazon's hands. I mean, the more desperate a seller is for sales, the more likely they are to agree to Amazon's terms, to those fees, to everything. Bingo. And speaking of which, let's talk about fulfillment by Amazon FBA, as it's known in the biz. Okay, FBA. It's this hugely popular program, right? Right. Handles all the nitty gritty logistics of getting a product from a seller's warehouse to your doorstep. Right. So the seller sends their stuff to Amazon's warehouses, and then Amazon takes it from there. Exactly. Storage, packing, shipping, even customer service, the whole nine yards. Incredibly convenient, especially for smaller businesses, those without the resources to handle all that themselves. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal from a seller's perspective. I mm -hmm. mean, who wouldn't want to outsource all that hassle to Amazon and just focus on, you know, actually making the product? Sure. On the surface, it's a great deal. But uh, convenience comes at a cost. And for FBA, it's not cheap. Yeah. We're talking, in some cases, as much as 35% of each sale going straight to Amazon. Wow, 35%? That's a hefty chunk. It is. And keep in mind, that's on top of other fees, monthly subscription fees, just for using the platform, advertising costs, to make sure your product is even seen in that crowded marketplace. It adds up. So even though sellers get access to this huge customer base, they're giving up a pretty significant chunk of their profits just to be there. It's like paying a premium for, well, like you said, prime real estate. Exactly. And now, remember those delayed payments we talked about? Oh, right. The 38-day thing. Adds a whole other layer of pressure to the whole equation. Imagine waiting over a month to get paid for products you've already shipped out while you're still on the hook for all your costs. Production, marketing, the works. It'd be like running a marathon with a weighted vest on. Yeah, you might cross that finish line eventually, but it's going to be a whole lot harder. And then there's the pricing pressure. Mm. Oh boy, the pricing pressure. With millions of products all competing for attention, sellers are under constant pressure to keep those prices low, often lower than they'd like. It's a race to the bottom, isn't it? Someone's always willing to undercut you. Always. And Amazon knows this. They have this treasure trove of data, right? Data on customer behavior, what people are searching for, what they're buying, how much they're willing to pay. And they use it? Oh, absolutely. They can spot a hot product category a mile away. They see what's selling well, and boom, they launch their own private label brands, mm -hmm. often undercutting the very sellers who help them identify the opportunity in the first place. It's brilliant in a way, but also kind of ruthless. The system Amazon has created, it's like a, a flywheel. More sellers mean more competition, which drives prices down, which then forces sellers to lean even harder on Amazon services like FBA to try to get an edge. And of course, that just generates more revenue for Amazon, which they can then use to... Well, you get the idea. It's a cycle. You've got it. And that self-reinforcing cycle, it's a major factor in their dominance. They've created this ecosystem where their own success is you could say, intrinsically linked to the, well, participation of millions of these third-party sellers. Whether those sellers are always successful, uh, that's another story. It makes you wonder about the long-term sustainability, though. At what point does the pressure on those sellers become too much? Is Amazon risking pushing them too far, alienating the very businesses that fuel their growth? Those are the billion-dollar questions, aren't they? And there's no simple answer. Some folks, they argue that this kind of dominance is ultimately bad for competition. It stifles those small businesses, leads to a less diverse marketplace, less innovation, fewer choices for consumers, ultimately. Right. Then again, others argue that Amazon's massive scale, their relentless focus on efficiency, it ultimately benefits consumers. Lower prices, a wider range of products, 
all at your fingertips. It's a classic trade-off, isn't it? Convenience versus not, well, maybe less competition. And it's hard to argue with the convenience factor. I mean, who hasn't gotten spoiled by that one-click ordering the next day delivery? For sure. And we'd be remiss not to mention the impact on jobs, on the overall economy, love them or hate them. Amazon has created millions of jobs, not just in their warehouses, in their logistics operations, but also by giving small businesses that platform, that global reach. Right. It's a complicated picture, that's for sure. Okay, so we've talked about this working capital strategy, how Amazon leverages those third-party sellers to fuel their own expansion, how they've created this pressure cooker environment, how they use data to their advantage. But they're not just an online store anymore, are they? Cloud computing, grocery delivery, entertainment, they're everywhere. It's hard to keep up. What's the bigger picture here? It's like they've gone from selling books, just books, to, well, everything. You name it, they're probably selling it. And then there's everything else. Cloud computing, streaming services, grocery delivery. They're everywhere. They've definitely got their fingers in a lot of pies. But it's not as random as it looks, you know? Yeah. Amazon's expansion into all these new markets, it's actually a testament to, well, their ambition for sure, but also their ability to leverage what they already have. They take their existing infrastructure, their expertise, and find creative ways to apply it to new things. Take Amazon Web Services, for example, AWS. Okay, AWS, right? Their cloud computing platform, that's a big one. But how did they get there? I mean, from shipping books to managing data centers, that's a big jump. It does seem like a leap, but it's actually a great example of how Amazon thinks long term. They're playing chess while everyone else is playing checkers. Early on, they realized that they had this expertise in building and running these massive, crazy complex IT systems, right? I mean, they had to just to keep their own e-commerce operations up and running. It's all this stuff happening behind the scenes that we never really think about when we click buy now. Exactly. And they realized that this expertise, this ability to manage huge amounts of data, could be valuable to other businesses. So they took something they were already good at, something that was essential to their core business, and thought, hey, we can sell this too. Exactly. And it was risky. I mean, back then, no one was doing cloud computing on the scale that Amazon was envisioning. But they went for it, invested <laughs> heavily, built up a seriously robust infrastructure, and then had to convince the rest of the business world to you know, trust them with their data, with their applications. And it... Uh... It seems like that gamble paid off, to put it mildly. To put it mildly. Yeah. AWS is the dominant force in cloud computing. They're powering everything from, well, you name it, Netflix, Spotify, even government agencies rely on AWS. It's amazing. And it's become this massive revenue generator for Amazon. Oh, absolutely. Huh. Which, of course, they can then pump into new ventures and the cycle continues. Yeah. And this pattern, you see it with their other ventures, too. Like, look at grocery delivery. Sure, they went out and acquired Whole Foods but they're also building their own logistics network for fresh food delivery. Yeah. Same challenge, different product. Right, getting things from point A to point B quickly and efficiently, but with groceries instead of books or electronics. Precisely. It's like they see a problem, a logistical puzzle, and they think, we've got this. And, you know, more often than not, they do. But with this constant expansion, this relentless ambition, it makes you wonder, what is the end game here? Is there a limit to Amazon's ambitions? I mean, at what point do they say, okay, we're good? That's the billion dollar question, isn't it? Uh, and it has everyone in the business world watching very, very closely. Some people, they're starting to get a little uneasy about Amazon's power. I mean, they're already so big, so influential. They worry that we're heading towards this future where Amazon controls, well, everything. Not just how we shop, but how we access information, entertainment, even essential services. I can see that. It's like, yeah, it's convenient. But at what point are we just too reliant on one company? It's a lot of eggs in one basket. It's a valid concern. And it's not just worried citizens either. Regulators are starting to pay attention. There's definitely been increased scrutiny on Amazon's business practices, how they're wielding their power, particularly in e-commerce, and especially how they treat those third-party sellers. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out for sure. Can Amazon keep growing at this pace with this much power, or will they have to make some concessions, make some changes? One of the things for certain, Amazon is a company that thrives on shaking things up, on doing things differently. Love them or hate them, they haven't just played the game, they've rewritten the rule book. Absolutely. They force you to adapt. So if our listeners take away one thing from our deep dive today, what should it be? What should they be thinking about as they finish listening? I think the big takeaway here is that Amazon's story is far from over. 
This is a company that never sits still, never stops experimenting. They're always looking for the next big thing, the next way to grow, to disrupt. It's a story about what happens when you combine innovation, long-term thinking, with a healthy dose of ambition. Hmm. And that story, it's still being written. So next time you're on Amazon, about to click that buy now button, take a second, think about everything that went into getting that product to your virtual cart, the technology, the logistics, the sheer scale of it all, and then ask yourself, what's next for Amazon? What will they think of next? That is a great question and a great place to wrap up our deep dive. Thanks to everyone for listening. We'll be back soon with another deep dive on another fascinating topic. Until then, happy exploring.